Hey, everybody, this is Chris and Kathy from Petability Podcast. We wanted to take a minute to thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate every listener and are grateful for this platform. Please help us share our vision by subscribing to Petability Podcast through your favorite streaming app. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Petability Podcast and share our content on social media. You can also support the show by making a donation. Simply go to our website at petabilitypodcast.buzzsprout.com and click on the heart symbol at the top of the page. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simons. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. I'm very excited about our guest today, Chris. Today, we are going to be uh, interviewing Dr. Marge McMillan. Dr. McMillan is a graduate of The Ohio State University. She is also a board-certified radiologist. When I met Dr. McMillan many, 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 many years ago, she was the head of the radiology and nuclear medicine department at Angel Animal Medical Center. Very exciting times for us there in the um, mid-80s at Angel as Dr. McMillan started the first nuclear medicine program for the treatment of hyperthyroid cats with I-131 radioactive isotopes. So it was very exciting times. Um, Dr. McMillan is also a certified canine rehabilitation practitioner. She has a special interest in avian medicine and has been a pioneer in this field for over 30 years. She's the owner of the Windhover Veterinary Center, FYI, one of the first women-owned practices in Massachusetts, and the Sterling Impression Animal Rehabilitation Center as well. So welcome, Dr. McMillan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us, Dr. McMillan. I'm excited to talk to you today about birds because, as you know, um, birds are one of my most favorite topics. I love working with them, um, and I love just, um, I love what they represent, this sort of freedom um, and this intelligence. And when I was getting ready to talk to you about birds uh, today, I looked up to see what the, how popular they were, and they are the third most popular pet in the United States. Um, and so my first question for you, Dr. McMillan, is what do you think attracts people to having birds as pets? Well, I think there are several, several things that attract people. First of all, um, their beauty. Uh, secondly, they're somewhat easy to care for in that you don't have to take them for a walk outside several times a day. Um, so if you live in an apartment or you have a busy schedule, they're relatively easy. And then they have fabulous personalities and they are really intelligent. And also they, they talk. And so people think of them as little people in feather coats. (laughs) And so they make um, great friends and companions and um, the reward with them is unbelievable. I would agree. Um. Well, I have to interject here because true confessions, I don't know much about birds, but I do know, as you said, that I really enjoy looking at them because they are so beautiful and majestic. So both in the wild, you know, I might, uh, I have a hawk that flies above my house on a regular basis and it'll just stop me in my tracks and, or, I have several cardinals that that are hang around and and I think they're just beautiful, you know, so colorful and and such, uh, you know, quite fascinating. But for me, if I were to own a bird, I think I would be a little bit intimidated because I don't like anything that is somewhat unpredictable. So for that reason, it's a little bit scary, uh, you know, because they fly around and they're fast and they have strong beaks. So. I, I just had to get that out there, but uh, I, I am also thrilled that, that you're here to uh, maybe allay some of my, my fears through learning more about birds, and, and so I really appreciate you being on our show as, as a guest. And well, to- well, thank you, and I think, yeah, because they can fly, people think they have the upper hand, but for people that have pet birds, and 
I am all for birds being able to fly, but in our homes there are lots of obstacles that can be problematic for birds, like windows, that they, they don't have depth perception so they can fly into the windows. So people will have trims on their wings, not so that they can't fly, although if some birds are problematic, like they chew electric cords and get into um, uh, things, then people will restrict their flight. But often they'll have a modified trim so the bird can still fly, but they can't get up a lot of speed and that they um, can't buzz you and intimidate you. And so there are ways of dealing with the fact that they're superior to us in the fact that they can fly and intimidate us. Gosh. Now, smaller birds, like the cockatiels and the parakeets, not a big deal. I mean, they're really small. Their beaks aren't very big, and so they can't inflict a lot of harm. But some of the larger parrots, um, those beaks can hurt you, and if they become um, bonded to a particular person in the household, and so they choose that person as their mate, and birds tend to peer bond. Um, when their hormones kick in, they can become very aggressive with the other people in the household, and they can fly at them and fly at their faces. So in that situation, I do recommend that we do what I call the crew cut wing trim so that they can't get a lot of flight and they can't harm anyone. Who knew? This is so fascinating <laughs> love it yes <laughs> dr mcmillan can you can you tell me how did you even get interested in bird medicine because i'll i'll tell you how i got interested in avian medicine and and, and, and largely it was because we you and i had met when i was working at angel but to me as a technician i would much rather handle a little parakeet a budgie or um you know a, a, even a cockatoo other than that cat that's coming at you 100 miles an hour like an egg beater so anytime there was any birds to be handled i volunteered because um it just felt natural to me or less a little less scary perhaps to be handled with the birds but how did you get interested in avian medicine well i wanted to be a veterinarian from the time that i could say the word animal doctor mm -hmm. and as a child i had parakeets and canaries and my canary went completely bald so all my friends would come over to laugh at my bald canary no. and I was determined that someday I would know why my canary lost all its feathers and went bald and so from a young child I was interested in figuring out what happened with this bird so from the time I was about five or six years old I was very interested in birds and knew I wanted to be a veterinarian and then carried that interest forth um, as I went through my veterinary education. The reason my bird lost all its feathers is in that day and age we fed them only seed and I'm sure the bird was nutritionally deficient and that's why it lost all its feathers. Fortunately we've come a long way since then when we just had Hearts Mountain and they gave you a box of seed and that was it. Now we know um, better nutrition for these critters and keep them healthier and they live longer lives. That was actually one of my questions um, was about feeding because it seems as though when I see birds and in cages and things here and there that there often is fruit and vegetables and such so um, that I'm glad that you mentioned how important that is as it is with any being human or animal to have proper nutrition so. Right nutrition and exercise are the key to their longevity. And we've progressed from um, just seed mixes to pellets, which are similar to going out and buying a bag of uh, kibble for your dog. It has everything in it that they need. So these pellet mixes uh, are well fortified and have good nutritional balance. But birds like variety. So in addition to the pellets, you can mix some seeds in there, which is their preferential food. So uh, small amounts of seed, more pellets, and then they can eat a variety of fruits and vegetables. Basically anything that's healthy for you is healthy for your bird. So uh, broccoli, spinach, green beans, corn niblets, uh, they can have pasta. Um, you want to avoid things that are high fat, high salt, um, no avocado, no alcoholic beverages, no coffee. Um, and those types of things. But many people um, give their birds what they have left over from their meals, mm -hmm. and actually some birds eat with people when they're having their meals and walk through their dinner all over the table, yeah. which 
probably is not a good idea, but you can give the bird what you, you've had for dinner as long as it's healthy. Birds wow. love that social activity, just having their meal with their people. They just, they, I think they really enjoy that, that part of the bonding with their, their family. Um, can, you, can you tell us what, what we might need to look for or what the audience might need to look for if they have a bird to, to know if the, dog, if the bird isn't feeling well? How do we know? Because, you know, birds can mask illness very well. Um, you know, being part of the flock, you don't want to be the guy that, that's, that's showing illness because you, you might get killed, you might get eaten. What can we look for? I mean, one of the things you taught me that was so instrumental and so important for me in relaying information and history to you, Dr. McMillan, is that you can, teach, you can be taught a lot by a bird's droppings. What else can we learn? So because birds are prey species, as you said, they mask their signs of illness. So the important thing is to know what's normal for your bird. Know what normal number of droppings are, know what the color and consistency of the droppings are, and what normal activity is. And so when birds become ill, they tend to fluff up a little bit, tend to sit on um, a perch in one place, don't hop around. They will sometimes isolate themselves from the rest of the birds, um, sneezing, uh, runny eyes, their tail will bob up and down if they have a respiratory infection. And the dropping color change, if they have liver disease, their droppings can be bright green. If they have kidney disease, their droppings can get very watery. Birds can get diabetes, so they can have watery droppings all over the bottom of the cage. If they're not eating well, their droppings become a dark green pasty color. So droppings, yes, can tell you a lot about how the bird is doing. Wow. <clears throat> to that point, should birds have annual exams like dogs and cats do? Yes, they should have annual exams. In some instances, they should have exams twice a year as they get older. And because many of the medium to large size um, parrots can live 50, 60 years, they can get some of the diseases that we get. They can get atherosclerosis, they can have heart disease, they can get kidney disease. So in those birds, as they age, it's important to bring them in more frequently and to have annual blood work because often you don't find anything on physical examination, but when you do blood work, you will see that their liver enzymes are abnormal, their kidney values are abnormal, uh, they have low calcium levels, so they're not getting enough calcium. So as these birds age, more frequent examinations, but at least once a year. So to piggyback on that, I'm learning so much. I just have to to say, uh, I love who knew? Bird, I love her bird in the background. Yes, as we're, as we're doing this. Yeah, for our audience, we have to say that that is not like some stock recording that we put in the background for our podcast. It is actually Dr. McMillan's uh, bird. Tell us a little bit about about your bird. So um, Edward is singing, and he has uh, three girlfriends uh, circling around him because he's the uh, the chief male of the flight cage, and then I have uh, two parakeets, and I have two bronze wing mannequin finches, and then my cockatiel is climbing all around my feet, and my other cockatiel is perching in her uh, mini citrus fruit tree that's in my <laughs> in my living room. So oh. That's what we've got going on here. That's what you got going on there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I asked, you know, I'm like, tell us about your bird. Assuming I'm just hearing one bird sing. I had no idea that there were, you know, what, uh, over 10 that, that are there's, living in your there's, uh, house? There's eight. Eight. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, Chris, you would have loved her, her, her parakeet she had. I think he's since passed uh, Grover Cleveland. He was given up, I believe, because he only had one leg. But, oh, my God, what a character he was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, we had to amputate his oh, leg you... because the leg band got too tight That's and caused right. yeah. his, oh. his leg to die. Oh. And so we had to amputate his leg, and the people didn't want to do it, so I adopted him, and he was a real spirited little fellow. He really was. Oh, Grover so, Cleveland. So... That... I was just going to say that segues seamlessly into my next question. Sorry to interrupt you, Kathy, but I was just going to ask, like, in terms of injuries um, and things that can happen to birds in a physical way, you know, neuromuscular, musculoskeletal, since Kathy and I and you, Dr. McMillan, are all rehabbers, um, are there 
injuries and, and things like that that they're predisposed to that pet owners, bird owners should look for? Yes, well, first of all, if they have a leg band, it's a good idea to have it taken off because those leg bands can get caught in uh, cages, uh, many things around the house. So they have a leg band, getting that off will help to um, reduce some of the injuries. And then, of course, injuries from flying into objects like windows, uh, broken legs, broken um, shoulders, um, head trauma. And then, of course, the uh, birds of prey outside often will have um, injuries from flying into things or they're shot by somebody. And so um, those birds outside get lots of injuries from uh, hunters and things like that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Most of these injuries um, are, are treatable um, with um, cast splints. Um, Sometimes we have to do surgery and run a pin to bring the bone fragments back into alignment. But many of them can be helped by physical therapy. And as these birds age, particularly the ones that lived up into their 50s and 60s, they um, get arthritis. And so they can have horrible arthritis in their feet and in their knees and in their hips. And those birds do great with physical therapy and laser um, and range of motion. And most of them, because they're um, pet birds, um, can easily be handled and easily treated with um, physical rehab. Wow. I was going to ask, like, what, what kind of physical therapy, because there's a plethora of choices, you know, many tools in our toolbox. But you spoke to that, the laser therapy, of course, and, and doing some manual exercises like range of motion. And Kathy, I think early on, um, when we were still working together at Sterling Impression, I remember you were giving a professional talk to an organization and it involved rehabbing a, a bird and you were using little washers as weights on the bird's wings to strengthen, yeah. to strengthen yeah. the wing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I would like to reiterate Dr. McMillan's point too, that, that birds are actually uh, good candidates for physical therapy. And I, I think that oftentimes owners don't think that, but a lot of the things that we do in rehabilitation translates to the birds, the range of motion, even massaging, laser, things like that. Um, so they, and, and being a two-legged creature, you know, when they, they stand all the time, and if you have an injury to one leg, um, then now you've, now you've got one leg to stand on, right? So if you have arthritic, you know, legs or, or arthritic wings, you know, those, those can be treated. Um, and yes, I did treat a bird. Um, this is one of my most favorite cases. This bird fractured her shoulder, and because it, it was fractured and the time frame that, that it was taken to heal one of the biggest complications for her was that she had lost her balance over it and she kept falling and, and cracking open her keel bone. So she kept re in, she was not only injuring herself, not only injured herself, but kept re-injuring her, her keel bone. And so it was really important for us to get that muscle mass back and that tone and the strength and the ability to balance for her was really key. And so to develop that strength in that wing, I just took a couple of washers and a little bit of vet wrap and we you know, wrapped it around the wing and we practice, you know, our flapping and our balancing and uh, she regained full range, range of motion in that wing. And uh, she went on to terrorize many, many other people actually after that. So. <laughs> and and yes. remember that chickens now are, are a mm -hmm. big um, thing and mm -hmm. that people get chickens because they want them for the eggs and then they become pets. And so when princess has a problem or gets injured, that the chickens come in and we actually made a cart for a rooster. It was a rooster that was 10 years old. He lived in the house. He developed paralysis and we made a cart so that uh, he could get around. And um, chickens have lots of problems with their feet. They also get arthritis as they age. And, um, you know, Princess was a little Easter chicken and now mm. Princess is seven years old and all the children love Princess and they want princess to get the best care possible. People love their chickens. They, they, love, love, their, their chickens. they love their chickens. chickens are really much smarter than people give them credit for. They really are. And that actually brings me to my next point because what I'd really like people to have an understanding of about birds and owning birds is dispelling that myth, that bird brain myth. Um, birds are really intelligent. Um, really, really smart, and we are not giving them enough credit for that. Can you speak to that a little bit, Dr. McMillan? Because birds have, not only do they have intelligence, but in my, my opinion, they have a sense of humor, they have rhythm, they like music, so they have a whole emotional life that maybe we don't think about. 
Yes, that is true. And their intelligence, some people estimate the intelligence of parrots to be around a five-year-old child. I think it's even greater than that. And the crows are mm. amazingly intelligent. If you ever go outside and watch crows and how they interact and what they can accomplish. And there was one study that they did with crows that um, – the crows were getting nuts, and they couldn't crack them, so they dropped them on the street, let the cars run over them, crack the nuts, and then they go down and get the nuts <laughs> after they were cracked. Crows can also learn to talk, and so I think we totally underestimate their intelligence. And if you live with a bird, they're usually way ahead of you and outsmart you and know um, what you're going to do before you know what you're going to do. So they are just amazingly intelligent creatures. And Cy Montgomery, who wrote the book Birdology, if you want to read about birds and their intelligence, read Cy Montgomery's book Birdology. I'm going to read that. So are, are we, how are we doing as far as having birds as pets with their environmental enrichment? You know, are we doing okay with recreating their environment? Um, or how can we recreate their environment a little bit better for them to give them that environmental enrichment, that stimulation that they need? So we've come a long way from the decorator bird in the cage in the dining room. Right. Um, that's where birds were when I started. And now most people that have birds have done some research and they understand that these birds are social creatures and they um, enjoy interaction and they need stimulation and appreciate how smart they are. And so there are lots of um, puzzle toys that you can engage them with, foraging for food, so taking um, pieces of wood and drilling holes and hiding nuts in them, uh, hiding um, food in egg crates so they have to find it. And as I mentioned earlier, I have a miniature uh, citrus tree that my birds can perch in, and they have ladders to climb in it and toys hanging off it, and they have feed dishes in it, so they have sort of a little mini jungle and I have been to people's houses um, on house calls in the past where the birds had an entire room that was filled with all kinds of objects and ladders and things for them to uh, perch on and engage with and to be mentally stimulated. So we're doing a lot better. Uh, some people that come in, it's a real effort to educate them that that's what the birds need. Birds sitting around on a person's lap all day, interacting with that person and just bonding with that person doesn't do justice for that bird. They need lots of stimulation. It doesn't fulfill that need for foraging and for chewing and community, right. you know, yeah. Yes. Thank you. So earlier, Dr. McMillan, you said that, that some birds can live up to 50, 60 years. In doing a little bit of research for this talk, I saw that uh, it, it can actually be up to 95 years. And so you know, in terms of people, you know, hearing all of this great information, they may think, oh, I want to run out and, and get a bird. This sounds incredible. Can you talk a little bit more about, like, the commitment of bird owners? And I know that there's also, it's very important to, to realize how long they live. And there's actually uh, things that people put, like, in their wills and such for their care should the owner pass on before the bird does. Yes. The oldest bird I ever saw was 96 that could actually be documented, that had been handed down from generation to generation. So yes, if you get one of these medium to large size parrots, an Amazon parrot, a cockatoo, a macaw, the potential for them outliving you is there. So you do need to provide for them or make sure there's going to be someone that will take them and care for them after you pass. And um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is, like, I had an Amazon parrot that lived to be 52, and after she passed, I realized I wasn't going to live another 50 years. So I got birds that I know will not live 50, 60 years, and so I have cockatiels, and they average about 20 years. So the thing about these birds is because they're so bonded to people that if if they outlive you, they go through a period of grieving. I mean, they mi really miss the human that they were bonded to. And so it's a good idea to socialize them with a person or people that will take this bird 
if you should die before the bird does. So yes, planning ahead and setting up some financial um, funding for their care is important. Does that mean that a lot of birds end up in rescues? Well, I think a lot of birds end up with re in rescue not because they outlive their humans, because people don't realize what a commitment they are, and they can't um, fulfill that commitment, or the birds develop some neurotic habits like pulling their feathers out, and there's no magic cure for that. It involves really interacting with the bird, um, intellectual engagement, foraging. People don't have the time. They've decided, well, I don't want this bird anymore. So a lot of them end up in rescue because of those things, not because their humans have died. Mm. I'm going to interject here, Chris, because I'm going to do a shameless plug for somebody that I, that an organization that I love dearly called Project Perry in Louisa, Virginia. And they're a, uh, a fantastic rescue organization that takes in birds, oftentimes from hoarding situations, um, but sometimes because these birds have developed some type of behavioral issue like screaming or feather plucking, or maybe the person had the bird and then got married and the bird hated their husband and then they had to find a place for this, these birds to go. Project Perry does a fantastic job with, um, with rehabilitating these birds, with integrating them into flocks and, and just sort of getting them that social interaction that they need. So if you're anybody's out there that has a bird and they're interested in um, donating any, any uh, funds to any organization where the money goes directly to taking care of their birds, you should check out Project Perry. Good to know. Uh, you said before that, um, that, well, Kathy, you mentioned like a hoarding situation mm -hmm. and such. Um, like, how do, how do people know what sexes of birds they're getting and can it get out of control? Like people that have rabbits in terms of you have baby birds and all of a sudden they end up with more birds than they ever expected? Is that a fair question? That's a fair question. And most of the time, it's not due to overbreeding of these birds. Actually, birds are hard to breed um, <clears throat> in our households unless you're specifically set up and have the right type of flight cages and situations for getting these birds to breed. And they don't have a lot of babies all at once. They average about two to four um, babies. So it's not so much because of that. People just keep rescuing more and more birds, uh, and they don't have adequate space and can't provide them with adequate care. It's sort of like the hoarding situations with cats. It's not so much overbreeding, it's taking in more animals than you're capable of handling and caring for. So are there breeding programs today to supply the demand? As Kathy mentioned earlier, that it's the third most popular pet in the U.S., or, you know, I, I think I remember back in the day, these horrible stories about, you know, taking these beautiful birds, like, out of the Amazon and such. Does that still happen, or, or are no, they bred? They, you, they, they are bred. Um, there are breeding facilities um, for, for raising these birds. As I said, parrots, the larger parrots have about two to four uh, eggs in a clutch, and they breed a couple of times a year. So you have to have a large number of birds and the medium to larger parrots to meet the demand. The smaller birds like uh, cockatiels and budgies um, have about four eggs and they breed a couple of times a year. And people that uh, produce these birds for pets usually have very large breeding facilities and huge flight cages. Uh, mm. So uh, the, 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 we stopped importing these birds in the 1980s and horrible things happened to these birds coming into our quarantine stations. But one of the justifications for bringing them in out of the Amazon jungle is we were destroying their natural environment and they were going to become extinct. And that to some extent was true, but I don't think justified bringing in so many birds and losing them in our quarantine stations. But those people that um, had vision realized that we were going to make these birds extinct. So they did set up breeding facilities. And because of those, we now have birds that are no longer present in the jungle, but also these people that are conservationists now breed these birds and train them to be reintroduced to the jungle. So this whole conservation mm. effort by those people who were responsible in bringing these birds in and setting up genetic breeding pools so that we would have it as the Amazon jungle became destroyed have really saved certain species of these birds. 
So a couple of fun facts. You mentioned uh, earlier about the large birds having really strong beaks. And again, in my vast research on the Google, I saw that it can be up to 700 pounds per square inch. So to me, that could remove a, a digit. That, that's correct. Um, some of these birds, like the hyacinth macaws, which are the beautiful, big, blue-purple ones, they can crack coconuts with their beak. Wow. It's that powerful. So, yes, they can, they can break a finger or um, remove it. I had one client who bred uh, cockatoos, and he had the large cockatoos, the uh, Moluccan, which are the salmon-colored crested ones. And one of his male breeding birds ripped his nose off. He had to have plastic surgery. Oh, my surgery. God. Yeah. Well, wow. and, and I was even reading, too, that some of the little birds, you know, it's, it's kind of like per their body weight that they have. And they were talking about in the Galapagos, there were um, these finches that their beak strength was 320 times their weight. Yes. Yep. So that's just crazy. Listen, if you it ever is. had a budgie grab you underneath the fingernail, I don't care, I don't care who you are. You're crying. You're crying. <laughs> and, and earlier, too, you talked about, you know, people uh, maybe getting birds because they live in an apartment and they have relatively easy care. But then we also talked about them ending up in, in maybe uh, rescues and such. And one of the reasons that I've heard is because they are so loud and, you know, they have this scream. And so people may get evicted from a, an apartment building. How, how loud can a, can a bird scream? Oh, well, those are the larger birds. I mean, the, well, those are like the Amazons and the macaws and the cockatoos. It's pretty piercing. I mean, you can hear it um, many, many apartments down in an apartment complex or in a condo complex. However, you can to some extent, train them out of that. You can click a train um, to get them to quiet down. But it is their natural instinct to scream and talk, usually early morning, late afternoon, bringing the sun up and bringing the sun down. So you can modify it a little bit, but you can't make it go away completely. So if you are in a situation like that, you certainly want to consider getting a smaller bird, like a cockatiel or a conure or a parakeet or finches. And, you know, we talked a lot about enrichment and keeping them stimulated, but I was also reading about uh, the need to potentially cover the bird's cage because they also need restorative sleep, just like any other bee. Yes. I cover my birds. I recommend that people cover their birds, but you need to be consistent in what you do. If you cover every night, cover every night. If you don't cover, don't cover. Um, I think they do need a place where they can be away from us humans to recover and restore themselves. Some um, of these medium to smaller birds have these little sleeping nests called uh, sleep buddies that they can crawl in. Also, sometimes these large coconut shells, you can carve them out and put a perch in and they can hide in that and sleep in that. And the thing about birds that's interesting is they have hemispherical sleep. That one side of their brain sleeps and the other side is alert. And that's part of their um, nature as a prey species. That one side of their brain is alert watching for predators while the other side is asleep. So I think that's really fascinating. And they do need a way where they can be private and have some time away from us. Because in their natural environment, their cavity nests. They nest in trees and dig out holes in trees to nest, many of them. And, and, and when they're in a cage, do they actually uh, sleep on their perch, like standing up? They do. They sleep standing up on their perch. Huh, wow. Well, this has just been remarkable for me. You know, the, the bird novice. Uh, I have learned so, so much, as I'm sure our listeners are learn, learning as well. And, you know, even for those that have cats and dogs and, and so forth, you know, the more I think that we can learn about all the, the creatures that we share our lives with, the better. You know, it just helps us to, to become better human beings. Right, because this psychological and emotional life is an important part of their life, and that has been abbreviated for such a long time. You know, people think you just give them food and water and take them for a walk, and that's enough. It's not. 
Every dog needs a job. Every bird needs something that they can engage in and forage for. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I I uh, had lived with a bird for quite some time, and I I would absolutely say that he was the superior um, the superior brains of the operation. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean because he's uh, smart, but but trying to um, to provide that environmental enrichment for him was is was key for him and his health and his longevity. Um, so thank you, Dr. McMillan, for joining us, and thank you for enlightening our audience on birds and caring for birds. Can you please tell people where they can find you should they want or need uh, their birds examined, or can they consult with you? Where can they find you? So you can find me perched in a large oak tree as you cross into oh, Walpole. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's you? But, okay, all right. When I'm, not, when I'm not there, the Windhover Veterinary Center in Walpole, Mass. Okay. And do you have a way for people to consult with you via Skype, or should they not be in the Massachusetts area? Is that available yes, for them Yes, we do well? have um, Skype. You have to call the Windhover Veterinary Center, and then we will set up a Skyping appointment and uh, Skype you in. Wonderful. Skype your bird in, too, okay? So bring your birds yes. to that appointment. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Wow. All right. Thank you, Dr. McMillan. It was fantastic right, thanks having for you. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you again. So check out Dr. McMillan at her website at windhovervet.com, W-I-N-D-H-O-V-E-R, vet.com. There's lots of great information on that website, Chris, too, just about um, bird care in general. So even if you're just interested in learning a little bit more about birds, um, check out their website and you can get information there. Or if you have a bird and you'd like to have a consultation with Dr. McMillan, you can find all of her information there on her website. Awesome. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Chris. Bye. See ya. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at Petability Podcast. For more information about Kathy's books and living with blind dogs, please go to enableyourpet.com. Thank you and please tune in next time.